I'm Sam Roberts of The New York Times, and welcome to The New York Times Close Up. On this program, we feature leading newsmakers and The New York Times journalists who cover them. This week, outsider scientists are challenging the mainstream with a controversial theory about prehistoric climate change. But first, Super Tuesday results are in. Donald Trump, now the presumptive Republican nominee, Underpinning Trump's path to victory have been disgruntled white voters. They don't live in the nation's cities, as Paul Krugman explains in a recent New York Times op-ed column. Here to elaborate, Tom Schaller, co-author of White Rural Rage, The Threat to American Democracy. Paul Krugman says that this is the impact of technology, creative destruction, as it's called. He said the effects are laid out in devastating, terrifying, and baffling detail in the book by Tom Schaller and Paul Waldman. Uh, and Paul says that he doesn't quite understand the politics of this. Tom, what are the politics of this creative destruction? Well, I think we really have to think about the politics in terms of material and economic issues and cultural issues. And the fact of the matter is, as we argue, um, white rural Americans have, in a weird way, uh, every reason to sort of give up on the political system. Not that we are uh, justifying uh, uh, their decaying commitments to democracy, but they look at the political landscape. They see the two parties. They feel like neither of them can deliver them uh, economically what they need. And there's a certain truth to that, Sam, because as you point out in the quote from Paul Krugman, you can't go to Congress and say, pass a bill. You could pass a bill with unanimous votes on both sides of the aisle saying globalization must stop and foreign countries and third world countries have to stop hiring children and paying them 50 cents an hour with, you know, no environmental protection. So you can't legislate that away. You can't go to Congress and say, we're not going to allow coal mining comp companies to use mountaintop removal, where they rip off the top of a coal mine and then use giant mechanical shovels to remove the coal tons at a time, rather than digging a hole and sending miners in back in the old John Sayles Matewan movie uh, with the lunch pails between their ankles to dig it out with a pickaxe and a shovel one pound at a time. And so the kinds of things that are leading to the destruction of rural economies, particularly extractive economies, a farming has been replaced by big agriculture. You can't write a bill to make that go away. You can't pass a regulation. And so they look at the two parties and they maybe conclude rightly that neither party can re, you know, deliver a, a, an economic revival. And so what should they vote on? They should vote on the party that's closer to them on cultural issues, on immigration, on trans rights, on on gay rights, on, on critical race theory and pronouns. And I think that's why Republican politicians just sell, sell rural white Americans a steady diet of culture war claptrap. It gets their votes. They don't have to deliver anything in terms of economic benefits. And it puts us in a situation where rural white America votes very, very differently from the rest of the country and votes against their interest in a way that I think is we argue, is leading to potentially the crumbling of our democracy. I'm a little baffled by one thing. Why only white rural Americans? What about whites and uh, in Queens and Staten Island, in the suburbs? What about blacks, Hispanics, who have a higher unemployment rate than uh, whites in general? Why is it just white rural Americans that you're focusing on? Well, as we argue, we, we coined the term essential min the essential minority. Uh, since the rise of Jacksonian democracy about 190 years ago, when we gave full suffrage to men of non, you know, the non-aristocratic -arist whites, people who were in many cases not even out of high school, semi-literate, and the Jacksonian democracy broadened suffrage to white men, let's be very clear, uh, of blue-collar backgrounds. Rural whites have essentially been part of every governing coalition, whether it was the Lincoln Coalition and that realignment from 1860 or McKinley's realignment in 1896 or the New Deal Coalition uh, with FDR in 1932. We were a majority rural country until the 1920 census. And since then, we've becoming more suburban and urbanized. And so as the shrinking share of the rural population generally and the white population specifically has happened, that essential minority, although they they wield inflated power in the Senate, thanks to mal malapportionment, they wield inflated, inflated power in the Electoral College with the two extra Senate electors, which is how Trump and George W. Bush got into office despite losing the popular vote. They've seen their power waning in a way that minorities and whites in the cities and even minorities in rural America either never had that power 
or are seeing their power rise with their numbers. And so they're holding on, grasping to a power that is slipping away as their population share shrinks. 20% of rural America, 20% of the country lives in rural America, and fully one fourth of that now, 24% is non white. That means the remaining three quarters or 15% of the nation is a very, very small chunk. They do have inflated power, but they feel like the country is getting away from them. And I think that's why you hear talk of great, great replacement theory. That's why you see resistance to Black Lives Matter and critical race theory, because they feel like the country has long been theirs and now it's ours. And as we argue, this is the sort of patriotic paradox. They believe in my country, but not our country. And that's an unfortunate turn of events, because as we've seen, rural movements in Europe are destabilizing the democracies there. And now it's coming here to America and people need to speak up and recognize it before it's too late. Tom, they do get a lot of help from Washington. They get Social Security, they get Medicare, they get food stamps, they get lots of other subsidies and farming and other things. Uh, President Biden proposes more taxes on corporations. Uh, what do they think they're going to get from a Republican or Trump administration that they're not getting from a Democratic one? Retribution, right? Anger and fueling their anger. You're exactly right, Sam. Um, rural America, there are 400 federal programs targeted specifically to rural America, and they're not just agriculture and mining. They're transportation, college education grants, sewage treatment, um, you know, local municipal programs, uh, education programs. 70 of those 400 programs are at the USDA alone, uh, but the other 330 are not wedded to agriculture. More to the point is, as you say, Look at what happened on health care, for example. Obama comes in and he passes the Affordable Care Act in 2010. Within nine years, rural un uninsured rates went from 24 percent to 16 percent. That's an 8 percent net reduction. That's one out of 12 rural Americans who were uninsured when Obama took office, were insured by 2019 by the middle of the Trump administration. And it's a one third reduction from 24 percent down to 16 percent. And the states that adopted the Medicaid, um, like K Kentucky, which didn't call it Obamacare, they called it Connect, K-Y-N-N-E-C-T, because they knew not to call it Obamacare, have seen their health care metrics improve, whereas neighboring Tennessee, which still is one of 10 states along with Texas, which has the highest uninsurance rates in the country, uh, are watching health metrics decline there, mortality rates increase, uh, life expectancy decline. And so these choices are very real. And another weird effect of Obamacare is that it reduces what's called job lock. It allows people to look for a new job or go back to school or stay in the same industry and move across the state or across to a different state, whereas people who are scared of losing their insurance aren't allowed in the labor pool to take advantage of the capitalist system and ply their wares wherever they can best make the most money or retrain themselves. And guess who suffers the most from job lock in this country? Rural Americans. And so they're benefiting from those policies, but they're not voting accordingly. They didn't reward Obama, they didn't reward Hillary Clinton, and they didn't reward Joe Biden. In fact, rural white Americans went from 62% in 2016 to 71%. They moved nine points toward Donald Trump when the rest of the country moved about three points away from him. Can the Democrats afford to ignore them? Should they ignore them, the people that uh, Hillary Clinton, to some extent, wrote off as deplorables? Well, I mean, this is we get this quote all the time. And I first of all, I just remind people that if, if Hillary Clinton had said, you know what, these people are so morally bankrupt that Donald Trump could shoot somebody in broad daylight on Fifth Avenue, uh, they'd still vote for him. Trump said that about his own supporters. So that's a worse insult of his own supporters. And did they get furious with him? No, they laughed and turned out in record numbers for him to prove that they would vote for him, even if he was a murderer. That wasn't a deal breaker for them. But putting the deplorables kind of aside, actually, we argue that it means it's absolutely absurd that the Democrats, who've won the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections, as you know, are in constantly told, scolded, and not just by conservatives and the media, but by Democrats like Tom Vilsack, who's written entire essays saying they need to go to rural America, they need to listen, they can't condescend, they have to you know, really meet people where they are, and then they have to go back to D.C. and cogitate for two months and come up with a 12-point plan to reach out to their least likely voters. And when is the last time you heard somebody scold Republicans uh, and tell them that they need to go in the cities and talk to African Americans, their least likely voters, even though they've lost seven of the last eight presidential elections? And in fact, what they do is they tax cities almost hourly on talk radio and daily on Fox News. You have J.D. Vance, the so-called horse whisperer of rural America, during his Senate campaign say, I've got to go to New York City, a city he's visited many times, as you know, Sam, to raise money. And he says, is it more like season one or season four of The Walking Dead? 
basically implying New York City is a flesh-eating, walking zombie apocalypse. Now, imagine Chuck Schumer, the senator from New York, said, I got to go to rural Cincinnati for a fundraiser for the Democratic Party. Uh, do I bring my own meth and overalls, or do the rural people provide that? He would be excoriated for trafficking in the worst, most uh, stereotypical and false tropes about rural America. But J.D. Vance does it, and he wins a Senate seat because you get rewarded by attacking cities, uh, whereas Democrats have to get on bent knee repeatedly to reach out to voters who, as soon as you hand, put your hand out, they bite it. Tom, what percentage of the general election electorate are we talking about here? Well, as I said, rural America is about 20 percent of that uh, a quarter is non-white. Nobody talks about rural Latinos. We spent some time with them in the Copper Quarter of Arizona. Nobody talks about rural African Americans. We spent time in the seven majority black rural counties in the Albemarle region on the North Carolina-Virginia border. The remaining 15%, 75% of 20, is rural and white. So we're talking about, and they vote a little higher rates than their rural non-white neighbors. So let's call it 16%. We're talking about one out of six voters nationally. You've been getting a lot of blowback on this book. How come? Well, we're getting blowback from people who say we're stereotyping and we're, we're the real racist and how dare you. Most of those people have only read the eight words in the title and the subtitle. I literally saw the New York Times, no offense, uh, a woman on the uh, editorial board write a, a very short blog post uh, the day after the Krugman comment come out admitting that she hadn't read the book and then interviewing two people who I know, who I know for a fact hadn't read the book. So, you know, frankly, we're getting blowback from MAGA people on the right and rural white Americans. And then there's a, a whole bunch of newspapers nationally, some of which you might be quite familiar with, who do not want to run our commentaries. And we have submitted those commentaries. So it's interesting that sort of the so-called liberal left media who are writing piece after piece about the threats of democracy do not want to address this argument. The, the people who have welcomed us the most, believe it or not, are the never Trumpers, the people from the Lincoln Project like Rick Wilson, Matt Lewis, people who frankly know this community better than we do. Uh, and have left the party because of what they are seeing there. And they have welcomed us with open arms because they want us to deliver the message uh, that they have been seeing on the front lines. Tom Schaller and Paul Waldman, the authors of White Rural Rage, thank you for joining us. Coming up next, when a good story challenges good science. What's the younger, driest impact hypothesis? It proposes that a comet hit the Earth about 13,000 years ago and triggered a sudden cooling period that dramatically affected early humans and the megafauna they survived on. Despite a relative lack of scientific evidence, however, the theory has penetrated mainstream society, intersecting archaeology, paleoclimatology, astronomy, and even religious scripture. Writing for the New York Times Magazine, Zach St. George explains how a persistent narrative and distrust of mainstream science fueled a revolt. Zach, uh, why is this uh, theory hanging on when some scientists dispute it? It's a good question. I think, uh, uh, I think success of the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis uh, is, is a good example of the power of a strong narrative. Um, it's a compelling story. Uh, the evidence is difficult for average people to assess one way or the other. And so I think that's kind of allowed it to carry uh, perhaps beyond what the evidence would actually tell us. What is younger Dryas? Is there an older Dryas? Uh, there is an older Dryas. And um, I don't have a whole lot of details about that. But the younger Dryas is essentially the most recent period in Earth's history of rapid, uh, dramatic climate change. So it's a period of time when scientists are really interested. Um, it began very suddenly as the Earth was coming out of the last glaciation of the, the Ice Age, the Pleistocene. Um, and very suddenly the Earth cooled uh, back to full glacial conditions, and it stayed that way for about 1,200 years. And what is the evidence that this uh, phenomenon took place some 12, 13,000 years ago? Why do we think some scientists, some reputable scientists, say that this actually happened? Yeah, well, uh, many people will know about the asteroid that is believed to have killed off the dinosaurs. That took place 66 million years ago. And the primary evidence for that was a very thin layer of rock 
that contained uh, heightened levels of iridium, this, uh, this element. And um, only later did they find evidence of a impact crater on the, the edge of the Yucatan Peninsula, where it is believed to have struck. So this more recent event, uh, the scientists who say they, they discovered this event 13,000 years ago, much more recently, um, they had kind of a similar set of evidence. So these um, so-called microspherals, which are these little balls, uh, a tiny fraction, the width of a human hair that they found in this specific layer uh, dating to 13,000 years ago. Um, and then they found a whole array of other things that they say that pointed to um, an impact. And what is the evidence against it? Yeah, so pretty much immediately after these uh, this group of researchers uh, proposed this impact, a whole lot of other scientists came back and said, well, we're not finding the evidence you say you're finding. Um, some of the things we're, that you say you're finding uh, could be chalked up to ordinary earthly processes. Uh, you know, some of them even said, hey, this is uh, fungal spores. This isn't some... Uh, piece of of uh, a comet or, or what have you. So there's pretty immediate pushback from not only geologists, but from archaeologists and uh, paleoecologists, people who study ancient uh, mammoths and mastodons and other kinds of vanished megafauna that, that existed at that time. Zach, what you point out in the Times Magazine piece is that this wasn't just a big thud hitting the earth. It had vast ramifications politically, uh, geographically, uh, anthropologically, uh, changed borders, uh, changed politics. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so that's that's actually one of the, the points that, that is especially in dispute. One of the paleoecologists I spoke with said, look, I don't really care uh, if there was an impact 13,000 years ago or if there wasn't, what I care about is the purported effects. And these effects were pretty sweeping. Um, the, the researchers suggested that it killed off uh, the megafauna, so the mammoths and mastodons that I mentioned. It killed off the people who lived in, uh, in the Americas at that time. They say that it actually caused the cooling that took place at the Younger Dryas. Um, by basically breaking a big uh, ice dam that was holding back an enormous lake and um, causing all sorts of uh, ocean circulation effects. Um, they have suggested that it led to uh, a turn towards agriculture in the Middle East, um, Mesopotamia, which eventually led to civilization and what have you. So the, the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis um, with a kind of counterfactual, you can just imagine that if it didn't happen um, and have these purported effects, then the world would be really different. And of course, uh, the other side says, well, that's kind of a counterfactual of a counterfactual because it probably didn't happen. And proving that it happened depends, as you say, on synchronicity, that it all, all of these elements occurred at one time. So is there real evidence that that is so? Yeah, again, it's in dispute. The, the, the thing with pointing to a single moment in time 13,000 years ago is that uh, it's very difficult to date that precisely. Um, you know, so you have, when you have multiple lines of evidence pointing to this supposed impact, you have to have them all perfectly line up. You're in, introducing a lot of uh, dating problems and, and error. Um, so it's just very difficult uh, to, to pinpoint that date exactly. How come um, we can do it for 66 million years ago, but not 13,000 years ago? Yeah, and so it's a question of repeatability. Um, you know, if you go around the world, uh, scientists have discovered the same layer of iridium-rich rock at 66 million years ago. And, of course, initially the... Um, the scientists who proposed that an asteroid had killed off the dinosaurs had struck Earth uh, 66 million years ago. 
uh, they faced a lot of pushback. So in that way, it's very similar to, to the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. Uh, the difference so far, um, you know, 17 years on since scientists first proposed this Younger Dryas impact is that the repeatability uh, just hasn't been there in the same way. Um, there's still a lot of scientists who just said, we're just, we're just not seeing the evidence. Why is it taken on this sort of alternative science, this black science, this conspiracy theory, this apocalyptic uh, view, uh, as opposed to just, you know, on the one hand this, on the other hand that? Uh, why has it uh, become a much deeper rift in science? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think, again, it, it speaks to the power of this narrative. You have uh, the Younger Dryas is this period in time when, you know, all these consequential things are happening. You have the Earth's climate changing. You have uh, these amazing mammoths and mastodons and, and uh, saber-toothed tigers and all these, all these kind of amazing beasts. Uh, disappearing from off of the earth. You have uh, the beginning of agriculture and, and the beginnings of what we would kind of characterize today as uh, the familiar trappings of civilization. So you have all these amazing, these, these consequential things happening. Um, and so how do you explain it? Uh, I think there's a part of us that seeks uh, understanding um, over, I guess, I would say that understanding can come either through fact or through story. A, a narrative can provide understanding. So to have a single event that explains all of these disparate uh, events, uh, I think that's very appealing. What about trust in experts? If the experts can't agree, then who do we believe? Yeah, and so, so that's what appealed to me about this story is I think... Um, you know, I think archaeology is not an obviously uh, attractive topic for most people. Um, and yet you have this uh, this theory has, has really picked up steam and, and uh, has spread really deeply. And I think it kind of mirrors what we're seeing probably in, in broader swaths of our society, which is which is a kind of growing distrust in so-called expertise in, in, quote, elites, in, um, you know, journalists like you and I, in scientists and politicians. Um, I think there's a reflexive uh, kind of feeling that is maybe particularly American, but I think also uh, at work in the world at large that says, no, I can, I can do the research. I can figure out things for myself. I don't need you to tell me how it is. And so I think the fringe status of this hypothesis uh, has some appeal for people with those kinds of beliefs. I don't want to be dismissive or cynical, but I have enough trouble worrying about how to pay my American Express bill. Why should I care whether this occurred 13,000 years ago or not? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, 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 not of immediate importance, right? Like it's it's <laughs> it's not going to change how you go about your day to day um, life. But I think that's true of a lot of kind of parts of our foundational understanding. I think uh, I think origin stories are important. Um, we we like to know where we came from and and kind of why the world is the way it is. Um, and so you know, our society used to be uh, have have an origin story very much agreed upon that was based upon religion. Um, and, you know, today it's probably more uh, based on science for a lot of people. And so um, we have a kind of secular origin story with the Big Bang and evolution and these sorts of things. And so um, I think this hypothesis offers that. It offers this kind of fine-grained look at, like, where did civilization come from? How did agriculture begin? Mm -hmm. uh, why don't we have mammoths and saber-toothed tigers? So I, th I think it has that kind of origin story appeal. Zach St. George from the New York Times Magazine, thanks for joining us. And coming up next, 
my thoughts on feeling safe in the city. How safe is New York? Statistically safer than most other big cities and much safer than it used to be in the bad old days. But statistics can't protect you against muggers, auto thieves, and other miscreants. Governor Hochul's decision this week to deploy the National Guard and state police in the subway system may make some riders feel safer. Gun-toting guardsmen also may remind others how much they need protection and make some, especially black and Hispanic passengers, feel more vulnerable the way wholesale stops and frisks did. The police department recorded 386 homicides last year, the lowest number since the pre-pandemic year of 2019. Shootings were down too. But behind the numbers, as the journal Vital City points out, are some disturbing trends. As Nicole Galinas wrote in the Times opinion essay this week, quote, worse for the public mood is a hardening sense of disorder fraying an always fragile quality of life. While recorded crime is generally down, the number of people working remotely is up. Subway ridership and pedestrian traffic has declined. Does that mean that with fewer targets available, the decrease in crime might not be reflected in victimization rates? In some cases, police response times to 911 calls have declined. Does that mean one reason for the decrease in reported crimes is that some New Yorkers don't bother to report them? And despite New York's strict gun laws, which are being challenged in the courts, the so-called iron pipeline of weapons from southern states seems to be flowing faster than ever. In 2014, weapons from those places accounted for nearly three in 10 guns recovered from New York state crimes. Less than a decade later, they accounted for four in 10. Causes of crime are hard to pinpoint, and so are the trends. Swaying public opinion is even more problematic. Statistics won't protect you from criminals. Will automatic weapons, cameras, more cops, sturdier turnstiles, and deploying the National Guard might reduce the fear of crime. Maybe even crime itself. For The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.